An 11-year-old boy has been hurt in a shooting in Nottingham. The hunt's continuing for gunmen who shot dead a 14-year-old girl. The 64-year-old was shot dead. Gunned down in the street as she was heading home. Ruthless yardy gangsters taking hold of the city. Gun crime growing at 12 times the national average. Innocent victims caught in the crossfire. Nottingham is one of Britain's toughest towns. Nottingham once produced much of Britain's coal, but since the 1980s, spiralling unemployment has led to large areas of Nottingham falling into poverty. Nottingham's decline has been mirrored by a massive increase in crime. The problem is now so bad that the national media has dubbed Nottingham Assassination City. The gun brings the power, the money brings the respect. You get me, that's how people see it around here. In this programme, we'll be looking at why the city has been named the gun capital of the UK. We're getting innocent people shot in this city. We follow the police as they tackle gun crime on the front line. <laughs> and speak to those most affected by the violence. They actually drove off in the car and left Brendan lying, dying in a pool of blood in the middle of the road. In 1984, Nottingham's coal fields were one of the main battlegrounds for the miners' strike. Men from 16 forces had been drafted into the area, including special units equipped for riot control. Miners and police clashed at the picket line as the trade unions fought against the government's plans to close a large proportion of Britain's pits. At the start of the 80s, 40,000 men were employed in Nottingham's coal industry. By the end of the strike, more than 30,000 of these had lost their jobs. Large parts of the city fell into decline. Many areas are yet to recover. We have some of the most deprived council areas in the country. If you look at every single problem facing major cities, we've got it. The increased poverty levels were paralleled by an escalation in crime and a rise in the use of drugs. By the end of the 1980s, a government report stated that Nottingham was one of the four worst areas for drug-related incidents in the country. At the time, the authorities had started to see an increase in the presence of Jamaican Yardies operating in major cities across the UK. The Yardies were looking for areas to deal crack cocaine. With its rising unemployment and a high demand for drugs, Nottingham provided the perfect conditions for Yardies to set a base in the city. They saw a gap in the market and exploited it. What was the difficulty for us was that they brought firearms. And that's where we got the escalation in gun crime. They're always looking for different areas to get into. And the bottom line is that if there's a turf that they see that's going to be lucrative, they will do anything to get into it. And part of the problem is that they're very ruthless and they will kill to get whatever they want. The Yardies moved into the Radford area of Nottingham, a rundown estate close to the city centre. Over the following years, they built up a fearsome reputation in the city for using guns to control their turf. The ruthlessness and the viciousness with which they execute you know, their means and ways to attain what they want is something that, you know, people never can fully understand or comprehend. The community lived in fear as anyone who spoke out against them faced violent retribution. In 2003, Omar Watson was set to testify against a Yardy gang. The week before trial, he visited a barber shop on Peveril Street. Well, this is Nefertiti's secret, uh, a former hairdresser's or barber shop. And this is when 
Radford in Nottingham met the Wild West almost. Omar Watson was uh, sat having his hair cut one day when he was, he was actually shot and killed. Now, he'd survived an earlier attempt on his life and was due to testify against two men from the Jamaican community against that attempt uh, when he was actually shot and his, um, the men who shot him had never been brought to justice. The police responded to the threat of the Yardies by setting up Operation Lance to target illegal Jamaican nationals operating in the city. If you look at the number of people deported who are largely uh, Jamaican nationals that are here illegally, there are just close to 199 of, of those kinds of people have been deported. Today, the police are acting on a tip-off about the location of a known Yardie operating in the city. Because of the dangerous nature of their work, the officers' identities have to be concealed. The fact they don't know we're coming gives us that element of surprise, gives us that 10, 15 seconds to get in there and control the situation. You're never going to be 100% sure who's in there or what's in there, so there is an element of danger. We need to make sure the back's secured and the front's secured. Hammer's going to be enforcing the door. You know which order you're going to go in. As we go in, let's make it nice and loud so that people know we're coming and know who we are. Okay, are you the only person here? Yeah. As some of the officers apprehend the suspect, others surround the house. Are you dressed under there? Because we're going to search this flat. OK, and we're going to search you while you're present. OK, when you get up there, I want to search you as well to make sure you've got nothing on you that can harm me or you, OK? As well as searching the house, the special ops team conduct a thorough search of the garden. You could bury a firearm, you could bury uh, drugs, anything can be uh, buried. Anything that they obviously don't want us to find. The police have found their man. As suspected, he's an illegal Jamaican immigrant and will face immediate deportation. Since the police have, have run Operation Lance, we're beginning to see there are links between you know, uh, foreign nationals coming into this country and some of the criminality. On average, the police deport one Yardie every week. The gun culture introduced by the Yardies has now spread to all elements of the city's underworld. Certainly the gun crime problem emerged here uh, significantly because of people that, that were here illegally that had a propensity to use firearms in enforcing their criminal activities. Our local criminals, who weren't armed at that time by and large, had to compete or go out of business. And the only way they could do that was arming themselves. The difficulty is, having done that, having got into that, that sort of theatre of, of criminal behaviour, where is they used to solve disputes with rival factions or other drug dealers that they used to solve it by less violent methods? Now when you're armed, it's so much easier to use a firearm. And I think that's what we've seen, sadly. 18-year-old Daniel is an example of how guns have become part of everyday life for all of Nottingham's criminals. He began dealing crack at 16, and within a week, he was carrying a gun. So you don't buy a gun for no reason. You buy a gun because you're going to use it, or for your protection, really. I could get a gun quick as, I could holler, I could holler about four different people and get a gun. So boy, it's not really no long thing when it comes to a gun. I've seen all types of guns, shorties, revolvers, 3.5, 38 special. You can get a cheap gun for two for two hundred pounds, but that's not guaranteed to do the job if that's what you're buying a gun for. So basically, I say if you're going to buy a gun, you're going to spend about a grand, and know you're getting it off, as well, in the streets and knots, because you will get yapped. The demand for crack in Nottingham has increased by fifty percent over the last five years. For teenagers like Daniel, the profits are very attractive. I was working, and it was hard work. And then I just see my friend making money, so I spoke to I spoke to the person who he was working for. And then two twos, I've got my phone now. I've got my thing. My phone's ringing off the hook. You get me? So I'm thinking, yeah, fuck work. You get me? It's all about this life, eh? Come home, got like two hundred pound a day. Them things there, or I could go to work. I got like 50 pounds a day and I'm tired. I don't give a fuck. I'm just going all out. I'm either get rich or die trying. <laughs> you get me? 
When Daniel was arrested, he was in possession of a firearm and a large quantity of crack cocaine. His story illustrates that, even for low-level street dealers in Nottingham, guns are a tool of the trade. A lot of it does boil down to the drugs. The police tell me that, you know, if they sort out the drugs problem in Nottingham, then they'll sort out the gun crime problem in Nottingham. That's what they totally believe. The police have set up Operation Stealth to combat the escalation of drug and gun crime. It was on one of their patrols that they picked up Daniel. And today, they're out looking for more dealers like him. The gun culture isn't like a separate entity to any other criminality in Nottingham. It's, it's all interlinked with drugs and gangs. While we're with the team, they close in on two more suspected drug dealers. The intelligence is about a couple of guys on bikes. Obviously, they're on bikes, so those alleyways around here, it's easy for them to get away. But as the police approach, they're just going to scatter. So we're trying to now get so we can be both sides of them. Yes, yes. What I'll do, Wardy, is have a couple of us uh, have a walk through, try and flash him back towards you. He's either going to come out here or down at the park, which is further along this road. So if someone wants to come with me, Yep, we're coming uh, through to you. No. I think they've, uh, the two CID lads have got him further down here. The two lads on bicycles are only 16 years old, but they're already well known to the police for drugs offences. Yeah. Yeah. Both, both, both compliant, so there's no need for anything, you know, we don't need to get aggressive, there's no need for handcuff or anything like that. They're being compliant, doing as they're told. So we're just going to wait for the vehicle to come out so we can transport them and the search is going to be done uh, somewhere away from the street. A search of the two teenagers revealed £800 and a three-inch switchback blade. Traces of crack cocaine were also found, but not enough to lead to a prosecution. These young drug dealers were not found in possession of a firearm. But over the last two years, Operation Stealth has seized over 300 guns, 6,000 rounds of ammunition and nearly £10 million worth of drugs. <laughs> Gun crime in Nottingham has increased drastically because of the influx of ruthless Yardie gangsters from Jamaica. The Yardies moved into the city to peddle crack cocaine, and the local criminals responded by arming themselves so they could compete and stay in business. This has led to a massive increase in the availability of firearms in the city, and guns are now being used in seemingly random acts of violence. The community is living in fear, and as this CCTV footage from a Nottingham news agent shows, even relatively minor crimes are being committed with the use of a gun. Nottingham's gun and drug problem is centred around a number of deprived areas. The worst affected is a large rundown estate just to the east of the city. If you look over there, that's the St Anne's area of Nottingham. And this is a real indication of how close that area is to the city centre. And, and, and the kind of contrasts in, in fortunes and the contrasts in money with, with certain areas, rundown areas of St Anne's, and, and no more than a five minute walk into the city centre where the, the, there's cranes and, and developments going on constantly. <laughs> Reporter Daryl Jackson took us into St Anne's, where many residents are living in fear because of the escalating gun violence. St Anne's is a, it's a very, very vast area, um, but it's not an area that's signposted. Local people just know where St Anne's is. Drug dealing and gun crime in St Anne's is so widespread that police have found kids as young as 14 carrying handguns. You've got the, the council estates, you've got where the gun crime is, where people have shot prostitutes along here as well. A recent report to the House of Commons stated a rock of crack cocaine can be bought for as little as £10, compared to the national average of 22. Unemployment here is treble the national average. The shootings are happening within the poorer areas, basically within these close-knit communities. In February 2002, St Anne's was rocked by a tragedy that illustrates how the availability of firearms has led to guns being used in seemingly indiscriminate acts of violence. 16-year-old Brendan Lawrence had lived in St Anne's all his life. He was travelling through the estate in a friend's car when they stopped in Watkins Street. Brendan's mom, Janice Collins, told us what happened. Brendan sat in the passenger seat waiting for the driver to come back and uh, two men actually went and uh, shot Brendan dead and then literally chucked him out in the middle of the road 
where Brendan died and they actually drove off in the car and left Brendan lying, dying in a pool of blood in the middle of the road. Although a full investigation was held, a motive for the killing has yet to be established. I'm still looking, and, and I'm sure the police are as well, that this was mistaken identity. Nobody would want to kill Brendan Lawrence. He didn't have an enemy in the world. Brendan's shooting was not an isolated incident. Since his murder, 12 more people have been shot dead on the streets of Nottingham. A number of these murders have been linked to a long-running feud between St Anne's and a rival estate called the Meadows. The exact origins of the feud are uncertain, but it seems to stem from simple local rivalry. Disputes between youths from the estates have often ended in violence, a situation made worse by the gun problem. I was talking to one of my friends the other day who's, whose mother still lives here as well. She said that um, the Meadows and St Anne's had this rivalry when she was a kid. That was in the 50s. But the trouble is, the difference then was they were using knives. But now guns are here, they can readily get hold of guns, they can get, you know, replica weapons and have them transferred and made into guns that they can use on the streets. We met up with 18-year-old Ryan. He grew up in St Anne's and although he has never been involved in any violence, he understands the rivalry between the two estates better than most. He took us on a tour of the Meadows. The way Meadows is, let, is structured is the way people who live in the Meadows community are. They like to just together. They don't like outsiders. They don't like outsiders coming and taking things from what's theirs, like, like girls, you know me? I don't think they'd really like someone who don't live in Meadows getting a job in say, like a Meadows pub. If they can all trust each other and they, they all know each other, they know what people are capable of, if they're going to run as a unit, nothing's really going to fuck up their shit. Because they're all together, they're like a big family. So, yeah, I can kind of see why they don't want outsiders to come in. The simmering tensions between St Anne's and the Meadows means that there is always a potential for violence whenever youths from the rival estates meet. Well, personally, I believe it's just to do with people, like, not understanding each other. You know me? Like, people... People don't know about the person. All they know is like the area code and where they're from. There might have been some tension in the past, what's gone on between these two different areas, and it's kind of still ongoing. A lot of the times when people have, people have got the beef, they can't even remember the source of the beef. It's just that it's just, it's just what they do. When they see that person, they naturally oh, give them a bad look or brush past them or something. When I was a teenager, like these kids are today, it was, it was probably a fist fight. But that fist fight didn't go on long because people used to jump up and stop the fight straight away, you know, whereas I think nowadays the kids are using the guns and people are too afraid to actually intervene, you know, to stop it. When we have like a carnival or something, when certain times when the different areas get together, sometimes there's a little bit of tension. In October 2004, St Anne's was the scene of a shooting that brought the severity of Nottingham's gun problem to national attention. Murdered in cold blood, a teenage girl is gunned down in the street. You have got to come forward and give the information to put these people behind bars. These people are evil. 14-year-old Danielle Beckin died after being shot as she walked home with friends from Nottingham's annual fair. The Danielle thing, that's, that's what I'm saying, like... Like, I never thought that would happen. I never thought that would have, would have ever, ever happened. Because she was just a young girl. There's no way, nothing she could have ever done could, could make her deserve that, nothing. So that was, that's just someone going on stupid with a gun. And that's the first time, that, like, the first incident when I thought, you with me, things are, things are bad. In the last five years, St Anne's and the Meadows have witnessed the worst of the city's gun crime. But recently, the problem seems to be spreading from these deprived estates to previously peaceful neighbourhoods. The residential district of Arnold, on the outskirts of the town, had no previous record of gun crime. But all that changed in September 2003 at a jeweller's in Front Street, when Nottingham's gun problem once again made the national headlines. An armed man had walked into the premises in a quiet suburb and opened fire on Mrs Bates at point-blank range. Her daughter Xanthe, here looking at flowers left at the scene, was assaulted, as was Mrs Bates' husband, Victor. I didn't think it could be ever this bad. I might have get jabbed with a knife. I might get sent with a pickaxe handle. I never 
thought or dream that anybody would word murder or try and murder my daughter or my wife in front of my very eyes. I mean, there appears to be no reason at all why Marion Bates was shot. It's probably just an example of how ruthless people are becoming. They're much more prepared to use a gun now, much more trigger happy than they used to be. The thing with Marion Bates is, you know, with her case, she was shot in Arnold, you know, a quiet town. That's why that case was so significant. That's why it made the police think, oh, we've got a problem here. It's moving out now. We're getting innocent people shot, you know, in, in this city. Nottingham used to be a, a, a safe place, a brilliant place, a buzzing place. But if I had teenagers, which I, I've still got one, um, you are concerned when that child goes out for their safety. I think uh, it's, def it's definitely going to get worse, especially when the police get guns. Because the next one they're going to think, well, now police to get guns, I'm definitely going to need a gun. It doesn't matter how many police officers you've got, people will still have their guns and they will still be able to fire them. There are people out there in Nottingham at the moment who are walking around there just itching to use these guns. I fear that the situation will get worse before it gets better. I, I think we're going to see a lot more shootings. I don't think this is the end of the story in Nottingham at all. I've heard it all before. We said it when Brendan died. We said it when Marion died. We're saying it again because Danielle's died. But I don't think for one minute Danielle will be the last.